A couple of weeks ago, I made a video talking about Logan Paul's latest movie, a film that was just a complete and total rip-off of an actual funny movie, 1980s Airplane. Crayon? No, thank you. I take it back. Like my man. <laughs> And that video did alright, and actually managed to get a response from Logan. Paul comes in and ruins the scene by giving the stands another excuse to jerk off by ripping off his pants. <laughs> Horrible analogy, but you see what I'm saying, right? But today, I wanted to move away from YouTuber movies and look at the realm of cult classics. Films that didn't do insanely well on release, someone on Reddit found the film years later, and now it's popular. And the film I want to talk about today is Cube. And more importantly, how horrendous its sequel was. But to do that, I need to talk about how amazing the first film was. I think the best way to explain how great the film is, is to show the intro. A man wakes up in a room unfamiliar to him. Dazed and confused, he rises to his feet, trying to understand how cold and alien this place is. He reaches for what appears to be a door, twists the lever to reveal another room. Similar in design, but pale blue in colour. He opts to stay in the room he woke up in and tries another latch, revealing a similar room, but red. Finally, he opens another hatch and musters the courage to climb through it. The hatch shuts behind him. Trying to understand the room, he takes a few steps forward and... Without even realizing what's going on, he's already game ended, and we're presented with a title card. This intro is amazing, and for so many reasons. It conveys the entire film in just one scene. People are inside a cube, they don't understand it, and there are traps. The scene has no dialogue or music, apart from the cube itself moving and shifting. Like, imagine instead of this scene, you just had a, a text scroll or opening narration explaining the cube. It, it ruined the immersion this intro provides. People are trapped inside the cube. The cube is bad. There are traps. I have to pay my ex-wife's alimony. The film begins proper with the main cast being slowly introduced to each other and every single person brings something unique to the table. One thing I really respect about this film is how it plays on how deceptive people naturally are. You have Quentin, the first character to physically appear, and comes across as your typical protagonist, assuming the leader role by being the first person to take control and calm the others down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm not gonna hurt you and opens up a dialogue on what other people's jobs were before the cube, telling the group he's a cop with three children. Worth, the glazed eye nihilist who knows more about the cube than he's initially letting on. Levin, the youngest of the group and the most innocent, wearing her broken glasses she woke up with. Holloway, the doctor of the group. She's the first to lose her sanity inside the cube. Ironic as doctors are meant to help people and keep composure. They came into our homes. They stripped us bare. They took my rings. They took- Oh, my amethyst. Also, Ren, the knowledgeable old man of the group, teaching the others the basic rules of survival. And Kazan, someone who is incredibly mentally challenged and plays Fortnite all day. This isn't Fortnite funnies. It's stuck. These are all pretty surface level descriptions and probably roll into other character tropes from other horror films. But keep in mind, all these people have only just met each other and want to work together to escape. Some more than others. But would you really share your entire past with strangers? Chances are you wouldn't. You just give them a superficial overview that makes you appear as best as you can possibly be. And as the film goes on, this mask starts to slip and we see what happens when people are presented with their most primal instincts. By the way, the traps in the cube are great. They are just terrifying and play on a lot of body horror. But honestly, they take a real backseat in the film. Only two people actually die from traps. The rest of the deaths are caused from mistrust and betrayal building up in the group. Ironically, the traps aren't the real danger in this film. It's the people. The only concrete thing we have about any of these characters is the surname printed on their shirts, and no one knows how they got inside the cube. Let's all just relax for a minute. 
Does anybody remember how they got here? Characters try to speculate who or what made it, but each theory sounds as far-fetched as the last. Everything in the cube breeds hostility. The cold surfaces, the unfamiliar circuitry dancing on the walls. The only thing telling one room apart from the other is the color used, which does play into the film, with white being a clear color and characters usually learning something new here, and red representing blood and death, where characters are usually dying or being injured in these rooms. The cube really comes across as this malevolent force that can't and will never be truly understood. Take a good long look, see. I got a feeling it's looking at us. The film also has no real soundtrack apart from montages showing a large passage of time. And most of these sounds are diegetic when the cube itself shifts around or Kazan tapping his head to keep himself calm. <laughs> As characters progress into each room, they learn more about each other while simultaneously losing their grip on sanity. He's the Wren. The bird of Attica flew the coop on six major prisons. Seven. You're kidding, right? One character I really like is Wren. He's the one who teaches the group how to survive. He's basically the tutorial NPC and is killed off only when the other characters have learned everything they need to from him. And he dies in the most poetic way by having his face melted off. Get him out! Hey, Peter! Any sense of personality from him is gone, but he still lives on by the quirks other characters picked up off him. Like, for example, when he shows the group that sucking on the buttons from the shirts keeps their mouths full of saliva. Suck on it. Keeps the saliva flowing. You can see characters sucking on buttons throughout the rest of the film. Quentin, who I mentioned earlier, starts off as the do-gooder protagonist. He groups everyone together, and by his logic... I'm getting out of here no matter what. But this does bring into question a lot of protagonists wanting to get from A to B. But what happens if the protagonist can't do that? What happens to them then? Do they compromise? or do they truly try to reach their goal no matter the cost? Quentin has a narrow viewpoint like most basic heroes, while other characters want to question what's around them, Quentin always asks what's directly in front of him. Keep your head down, keep it simple, just, just look at what's in front of you. Also as a side note, he probably has the best one-liner when testing traps in the other rooms. Booted. But as the film goes on, we understand that Quentin is slowly becoming unhinged. We can see his gaze change whenever he thinks that no one is looking at him, summing everyone up for their worth. He also begins to prey on Leave and obsessing over her, which gets the attention of the others and doesn't go down too well. All that bottled up anger. And a thing for young girls. There's this scene where Quentin unknowingly sets up a trap, escapes alive but injured, and you can see his real character come out, aggressive and brutal. A lot of people would be angry in this scenario, but with Quentin, you can tell this is something he's been harboring a long time. Somebody stop that racket! Door. His initial introduction, you can see his hand covered in blood, and his excuse as to why is pretty weak. I looked in the room down there and something almost cut my head off. His chemistry with the other characters is incredibly volatile as the film goes on. The Doctor, Holloway, begins as a nervous wreck, but slowly adapts to the cube, respecting its rules. She's actually the first to build up enough courage to directly confront Quentin. Huh? And he's not coming. Of course he is. When we get to the edge, we can come back for him, but he'll get somebody killed here. Am I right? Shame on you. What have you turned into? They may have taken our lives away, but we're still human beings. She always questions what the cube is and who put them there. Why would they throw innocent people in here? Are we being punished? She looks at the bigger picture, which goes directly against Quentin's logic of what's in front of them. She's someone that has no one to go back to. When other people lament about missing their family, all she wants is her materialistic things. I haven't got anybody either, but I'm not giving up. I am pissed off. They stripped us bare. They took my rings! They took- Oh, my amethyst. She later develops into a leader from taking care of Kazan, the mentally challenged character they find later in the film. 
Your boy's having a conniption fit in there. There's any conniptions? This shows that she's still an empathetic and caring character, and this worries Quentin because he knows he's only leader by strength. Later in the film, when the group discover the outside of the cube, Holloway makes the sacrifice to go venture the vast abyss. She nearly dies, but is actually saved by Quentin, only for him to help her up to the last moment and then drop her. He only saved her to prove to himself that he's still the leader and he decides who lives and who dies. It's a nice touch that Holloway has the same expression with her first and last encounter with Quentin. Worth is another character who clashes with Quentin, initially the nihilist of the group. I could only really compare him with Nick from Left 4 Dead. Hey Alice, shut up contest, ready? One, two, three, go! Someone who has such a cynical tone, he initially pushes everyone in the group away from him. He's actually the first to accept the cube's rules, but doesn't see the cube as beatable. When Ren dies, everyone is in a panic, while he just stares, accepting of his death. One down, four to go. He's actually one of the only people to openly mock Quentin, making us initially believe that he's the antagonist. But Worth is someone who's afraid to show emotion, as cynical people are usually scared of getting anything less than they hoped, so Worth disappoints himself before the world can do it for him. I'm just a guy. I work in an office building doing office building stuff. I wasn't exactly bursting with joie de vivre before I got here. Life just sucks in general. You can see in a lot of scenes, he's really only happy when the group is entrenched in misery. It's, it's, it's the Ren. <laughs> we going in circles. <laughs> this isn't actually him happy, of course. It's just his way of coping with the situation. Worth's later found out to know more about the cube than he lets on. And this is a pretty common trope in horror movies, you know, the, the character that knows the lore of the monster. But here, even though Worth knows more about the cube than anyone else, <laughs> he still knows next to nothing. I don't know anything about the numbers or anything else in here. I was contracted to draw plans for a hollow shell. A cube. His only interaction with the they, the big bad, was a phone call in his office over a plan for a giant shell to go around a cube. I talked on the phone to some people, other guys like me, specialists working on, on, on small details. Nobody knew what it was. That's how they stay in. You keep everyone separated so the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. The brain never comes out in the open. Worth thinks the cube is a blunder, a failed experiment, and while the group believe that they're being monitored, he believes that no one is watching. Life is out of control, and this is another one of its dead-end projects. Because honestly, the only thing scarier than a big corporation or government watching over you is no one at all. Why put people in it? Because it's here. You have to use it or you admit it's pointless. Only later in the film does Worth evolve into the protagonist Holloway was becoming, helping the others try to escape Quentin, coming out of his shell because he was shown kindness by the other characters. There's this great scene where Holloway and Worth exchange first names. They are the only characters to do this in the film, and the very next scene, Holloway is killed by Quentin. I think that this scene signified Holloway signing over her character to Worth, so he can pick up the mantle if anything were to happen to her. He only really evolves as a character after confessing about designing the cube. It wasn't humans' innate instinct for survival that was driving him. It was him trying to remove the guilt from his shoulders. Oh, well, I feel better. Worth completes his character arc as the hero by sacrificing himself to stop Quentin, allowing someone to escape, but sacrificing his own life, being granted the reward of being the last person alive inside of the cube. He'll surely die soon from blood loss or dehydration, but his conscience is clear. Worth's statement about the cube being pointless does have its weight though. Early on in the film, Levin finds numbers on the entrance and exit to each room and deciphers that rooms with prime numbers are trapped. This theory works until it doesn't. <laughs> She later finds out that the trapped rooms are powers of a prime, which are near impossible for humans to calculate. First I thought that they were identified by prime numbers, but they're not. They're identified by numbers that are the power of a prime. So for a large chunk of the film, they've been blindly wandering into rooms with the wrong information and still surviving. The cube seems to have this logic, if you make a mistake, it's instant death but it's obviously flawed if they've gone through so many rooms and survived. Quentin even falls into a trap and manages to survive. Ah! 
So Worth is right, the cube is flawed, and its only purpose is to keep existing instead of acknowledging its pointlessness. Talking more about Levin, she's probably the most blank slate during the entire film. A lot of these characters go through massive shifts in personality, but Levin stays fairly neutral. She's just a confused girl that wants to escape the cube. Her character actually helps build a baseline for the others. Like how Quentin begins to prey on her later in the film, going so far as to kidnap her when everyone is asleep and he opens up about his logic. Try and see what I see, how my mind works. The flash when I look into someone's head like a fucking x-ray. I dreamed him at his desk designing everything. Without Levin, we never would have got this scene of Quentin opening up. And honestly, after being able to get any sentence out of him that isn't hidden beyond a mask, is terrifying. Also, as I mentioned earlier, she's left with her glasses, something she needs to be able to see the numbers on the cube's crawl spaces. She is the only person in the entire film who has a personal belonging left with her. So this helps us understand just a little bit more why people were placed into the cube. They're not placed there just to die, but to try and understand it and escape. And finally, you have Kazan. He's introduced about a third into the film and comes across as mentally handicapped and a complete liability. We later find out that he's a savant and able to understand which rooms are trapped and which rooms aren't. But what's more subtle is throughout the entire film, he's always been warning the group about traps. It's just that no one wanted to give him any attention. There's one scene where he's muttering trap to himself over and over. Let's hope this one's safe. And when he shouts it into the room, not only is the room trapped, but it's a sound activated trap. <laughs> Chances are it's just coincidence. This is the only sound activated trap in the entire film. But still, there's many theories that he was one of the people who helped design the inside of the cube. And that's why I love this film. It gives no clear answers. Because what we can think up in our own imagination is infinitely more interesting and terrifying than something wrote up on paper. He's also the only person to actually escape the cube at the end of the film. He sees a bright light, as most people would question the light cautiously. Kazan just wanders straight into it without a care in the world. Unknowing and uncaring of what could be on the other side, because all he sees is a bright white light. Also, another cool fact is that each character is actually named after a prison that fits their personality. Ren, the teacher of the group, is also the name of a French jail that set the precedent for many prisons of today. San Quentin is a prison renowned for its violence and is the only California prison that still conducts executions. And Kazan is a Russian prison hospital for the mentally ill. So yeah, the cube is just baller. It's an amazing film that does this fantastic character study on the human psyche and shows how quickly our masks can fall off when put in a life-threatening situation. And now I've explained to you how great the first film was, I need to talk about how terrible the sequel is. Cube 2 Hypercube is a pointless splatterfest that ruins the entire philosophy of the first movie. It somehow does the amazing job of undoing all the foundations the previous movie set up. The opening shot shows people being prepared for the cube, sealed up in these plastic bags, but why would you do this? The first shot and you've already made two fatal errors. You've shown the characters before they've even been introduced, killing any kind of suspense of a character reveal in the film, something the original film reveled in in its first act. And secondly, you're showing the outside of the cube, even just a brief shot of this, and you're humanizing the cube. In the first film, we didn't know why people were placed into the cube or how. And half the film was the characters speculating, you know, coming up with outlandish theories as to why they're there or who put them there. Remember Scaramanga? The bad guy and the man with the golden gun? Yeah. He had some rich psycho's entertainment. <laughs> They also lazily copy the close-up eye shot from the first film, making it so much worse by adding these brief shots of her being taken from her job. Also, this intro has music totally going against the silent, tense intro of the film, because, you know, you need music to be told how to feel now. We get to see her ID card with a company on it, literally one minute into the film, and you've gave the people behind the cube a name, which makes it more understandable and infinitely less terrifying. Also, I don't know whether it's just me, but Eyes On sounds like a, a 2011 quickscoping clan. And uh, yeah, the, the woman's yanked off the screen and yep, yeah, that, that's our intro.
And yeah, if you haven't noticed, the cube is a bright white. And this isn't just one room like the original cube. This is every single room for the entire film. Some of the rooms were white in the first film, but they were symbolic of the setting. And even though white is the brightest color, the shapes and patterns imprinted onto the walls still made the cube feel unsettling. While here, it's just, it's featureless. I feel like I'm in a dentist's waiting room. And the thing is, bright whites don't exactly convey claustrophobia. So the film tries to compensate by these horrible close-up shots to create this bottled up feel when it's the equivalent of someone filming vertically. Also, remember the simple intro graphic of the original? Now it's CGI blueprints because, you know, what's subtlety? Look, look at all this math. You, you guys like math? Now it's been about two minutes into the film. <laughs> How could you make your sequel even worse? By acknowledging the core premise of the original and removing it. Where's the go goddamn numbers? So without any numbers, there's no logical way to understand and beat the cube, making it even more pointless than the original. He also has a briefcase handcuffed to him with nothing inside it. This never has any use in the entire film and goes against the original. People were only given what they needed to escape. Like, for example, leaving with her glasses so she could understand the numbers. Also, everyone in this film is dressed in the clothing they were taken in. In Cube 1, everyone had the exact same clothing, meaning their only individuality came from their personality, characteristics, and the surname printed on their shirts. In Cube 1, when everyone lost their shirts when Quentin dropped Holloway, it was a heavy moment, because if they died then, there was no way for other people in the cube to find out who they were. In this film, <laughs> everyone just seems to have an ID card on them, just saying who they are and what they do. The guy then starts praying after realizing what a dumpster fire of a film he's been put in. Oh, by the way, until we actually learn the characters' names, I'm just gonna call them whatever I think fits best. A hatch opens and we're introduced to our lead. Whoa. Woman begins checking on another character to make sure they're okay, taking on the initial protagonist role that Quentin had from the first film. The man then wakes up to attack her, and this is when you can see Quentin's two character traits as two separate characters. One, a goody two-shoes, and the other, a complete psychopath. Cube 2 does not understand what complexity is, so instead of having five traits in one character, there's five characters, each with a single trait, that do not evolve as the film goes on. Who the fuck? Who is it? What? Listen, kick your fucking ass! Who is this? Woman then finds other woman, and says that her name's Kate, and the other's Sasha. Sasha? That's a beautiful name. Again, she's being compassionate to other characters, basically taking all the good qualities of Quentin and Holloway from the first film. We're introduced to another guy, Jerry, and all he does is fiddle with his watch. I don't know. I don't suppose either of you two could let me know what we're doing in here? No. If you couldn't tell already, they add a watch fiddling sound in post that sounds like a glazed ham being cooked. Jerry explains that this cube doesn't abide by normal space or time. Basically, the writers wanted to one-up the original film, but what we've learned is that this cube can't be beat, so what's the point? Also, this cube makes a lot of groaning noises like in the first film. <laughs> but instead of it creating a foreboding sense of dread that everyone could hear but no one wanted to acknowledge, here, people just scream about it, ruining any kind of subtlety. Oh no, it's getting closer! <laughs> It's getting closer. Please, we have to move! We then see the old guy try to get out the film as fast as possible, but unfortunately, he's saved by the cast. Oh god! There's a guy hanging! This brings up another point as to why these people have their belongings. In the original, it was hard or impossible to game end yourself, because the point of the cube was to be killed by it, or to try and escape. The next scene, you've got the psycho guy from earlier, and he appears, and we find out that his name is Simon. Simon Grady. Also, really nice dubbing of his character, by the way. There you are. Also, we find out the old guy is a colonel from the Fortnite military. I don't care. And the guy who initially tried to save him, <laughs> he looks and sounds a lot like Todd Howard, so I'm just gonna run with that for the rest of the film. Okay, Max, how about you? 
I was writing games when I was, you know, 12, whatever. We actually find out he's a computer hacker and he hacked into the Pentagon. A buddy of mine's doing 10 to 20 upstate for cracking the mainframe on the Pentagon two years ago. I figure maybe that's why I'm in here. So at this point, it's pretty obvious everyone who's here is only here because they worked with or against Izon, which removes any mystery about who anyone is inside the cube. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get uh, your name. I'm Todd Howard, the game director for Fallout 3. Afterwards, we're introduced to some boomer woman, Mrs. Paley. Like any skooma addict, she forgets the person she's talking to 30 seconds later. Hello? What's your name? Don't you remember me? She's almost like Kazan from the first film, but instead of being mentally handicapped and a savant, she's just like any elderly woman when they don't have Facebook. Totally delirious and incoherent. We've also got the blind girl giving her insight, but honestly, it just comes across like Mama Murphy from Fallout 4. <coughs> don't mind me, kid. <coughs> I need heroin. The problem is here, if you haven't noticed, there are way too many characters and still with more to come. Many of them overlap into each other with traits and quirks. Some are mysterious, some are leaders, all of them lobotomites. Lobotomites! After they talk for a bit, the cube's walls begin to close in and they have to escape. Apparently, one-upping the original is having traps only kick in after 10 minutes of exposition. The colonel handcuffs himself and swallows the key so no one can help him. Kate tries until the last second to pick the lock, but she has to abandon him. Now after those 25 or so seconds of non-stop action, we really need some downtime. So let's have a montage of the group making progress through the cube. And instead of having a diegetic soundtrack like in the original, let's just have a... Wind chimes? Yeah, how... How much the film is let? Oh, sweet. Jesus Christ. Now we find out that the nerdy guy, Jerry, actually helped build the cube, much like Worth from the original. I designed the door panels in here. Both worked on the cube and don't know its true intentions, but while Worth was a nihilist who eventually developed into the protagonist, Jerry is just a, a straight do-gooder, you know, like every good character in a film. He wants to blindlessly help everyone and never questions their actions. The film has two sides, good and bad, with absolutely nothing in between. Oh yeah, uh, Mrs. Boomer from earlier, <laughs> she sees a shape on the floor and points out that it's a tesseract. A cube which every face is its own cube. Basically meaning it's in 4D, so rooms in this cube collide in and out of each other, ignoring our concept of space-time. Jerry is so happy with this discovery, his laughing track loops twice. A tesseract. <laughs> also, Todd wanders off to find a woman and uh, tries to sell her Fallout 76. Fallout 76. What the hell? He finds out her name is Julia. I, I tried to find some like deeper meaning with that name. All I got was a, a stock image of a woman and also a pastor. I mean, I got nothing. They also nabbed that part from the first film where the group used their clothing as a rope. Although this scene has... <laughs> No tension because the drop is about five feet. They also have this scene where they all try to explain where they last were before ending up in the cube. And this time they actually show footage of them doing their jobs outside of the cube. Firstly, this is incredibly unfitting for the rest of the film. You know, showing all these panels like it's GTA Vice City. It shows them doing general things like, you know, going through folders, driving in cars. So they could still be lying but he didn't need the footage to tell us this. It even shows an empty bed for the girl, Sasha. So <laughs> the film is telling us mysterious girl isn't being honest. I did not. Thank you, movie. Thank you. That you, you, you did it. Dollar store Quentin finds a watch, which is an exact replica of one they already have down to the engravings. If you didn't get with him fiddling with his watch 50,000 times, Watches are important. Also, they have this scene where the gravity in the room shifts, and instead of anyone actually acting like it's changed, they just flip the camera like someone's filming vertically again. Oh, uh, the gravity's shifting. What? They find this guy who they believe to be dead, and then he does a jump scare because, you know, all horror films need a jump scare. Oh god, Phil Rosenzweig. I read his book. <laughs> this dead guy seems to be the remnants of Ren from the original Cube, someone who learned the rules and dies. But instead of having a guy slowly teach them the basics, this guy solved the entire Cube for them because having to solve it themselves would have been too boring apparently. You know what? 
whatever gets the movie over quicker. I'm, I'm really not complaining. Mrs. Boomer also opens a hatch to reveal herself, only to be killed by, uh, Simon. Now, this scene would have actually created tension if Simon didn't already portray himself as a total douchebag. He's already threatened multiple people with his knife, and Mrs. Paley has done nothing wrong so far, so you have no reason to suspect her of any wrongdoing. <laughs> And if you're wondering if that's the big twist that she's the bad guy and Simon's the good guy, it's not. <laughs> the film is not that clever, guys. Literally the first thing Simon does is start giving people menacing looks with tense music. Alright, I mean, I, I think all oh, this is a hoax, okay? And I think Jerry's either full of shit or part of this experiment. Hey, Simon, I never fuck up. Because again, you need to know how to feel. You you don't know. The film needs to tell you how to feel. Remember how Quentin used to do this when no one was looking so it wouldn't break his character? Also, he starts threatening people with the knife again. Hey, man. What are you doing? Just a problem, man. His excuse for having one? Apparently, he collects them. I collect knives. We cut to another montage, and in the first cube, the dialogue in the montages actually meant something. For example, when Quentin and Levin were talking to each other, deepening their relationship. If we get out, I'll make you dinner. You got a date. But here, it's just <laughs> Sasha saying she's thirsty. Kate, I'm really thirsty. You're one of them special folks, ain't you? And also, this montage shows people going through the cube in slow motion. Like, isn't the entire point of a montage to speed things up? Also, Simon opens up to Jerry, saying that he's a private investigator. So here's the deal. I'm a private investigator. I'm on a case, missing persons. It's like that scene where Worth and Holloway open up to each other near the end of the film. But here, it just comes across as really forced, as these two have had no friendship, apart from Jerry explaining stuff and Simon waving his knife around. Why did that even need to be kept a secret from the others? Also, uh, one of the traps comes out, finally. God, I hope it kills them all. It's like this poorly CGI square that multiplies and starts attacking them. Really? No! Jerry acts like his entire back got chewed up, but when he falls to the ground, he only grabs his shoulder. And then he's picked up again and actually killed, which, you know, it, it just shows the cube is flawed. Traps only seem to activate after montages or exposition dumps. Then the trap disappears, and we find out it's motion detected. It responds to our movements. Don't move. See, the thing is, in cube one, traps actually had rules, but in here, they just made up as they go along. There was this one great trap in cube one that was sound based, so the entire group had to move through the room without making any sound. The scene goes on for about four minutes, and it is terrifying with no music to accompany it. Bruh. <laughs> In the original, when characters were killed, it greatly changed the group's dynamic. But here, they're just killed for the sake of it. There's too many people. If someone dies, three more people are going to pop up. Also, there's this slow-mo shot where the two girls are, like, panicking, even though the CGI is moving at the normal speed. I think they've just gave up. Also, just to prove that Simon is the bad guy even more, he's tied up Mrs. Paley and threatening her with his butter knife. And then the same trap that killed them both earlier appears in front of them. Now, Simon does actually make an attempt to save her. This is, like... <laughs> The only character depth he has in this entire film. And then he ruins that by just killing her before the trap even can. Like, <laughs> do you guys get that he's evil yet? And just to make him out as even more of a bad guy, the trap doesn't actually kill her. She dies of blood loss beforehand. And then Simon just, you know, he starts chasing people that are left alive with his knife. I think Todd Howard hit a lag switch or something because he, he starts phasing out while he's running away. Now, you guys remember how Quentin started off as the heroic lead only to descend into villainy? Simon just starts off as a brainlet and gets worse from there. Th there is no redeeming character trait. He also finds Jerry from earlier who's alive and well, which means that no one who dies in the cube stays dead. And this lowers the stakes of the film even more because what's the point if no one can truly die? This is meant to be the point Simon fully snaps. Knowing people who die in the cube will still be alive somewhere else. Now, this would have been a really great turning point if he wasn't already a douche. In the first cube, Quentin gets this one humanizing scene when he's gone off the edge. When the group loop back and end up in the first room they started off in, Quentin looks petrified. Not just because all the progress was for nothing, you can really see him questioning himself if it was all worth it. The choices he made that led him to the kind of person he had become. But here, nah, forget subtlety, bro. And then after which he finds another Jerry and kills him. Uh, do you guys get it? 
They're trying to prove he's bad without actually killing important characters. We also find out that Sasha, the blind girl, is this infamous hacker called Alex Trusk, who escaped into the cube to get away from Izon. Of course, Sasha's a nickname for Alexandra. Alex Trusk. Jaywalking. Simon finds Rebecca Young, the girl from the intro who got yanked up, and he was actually employed to rescue her. What do you think Simon does to her? No, seriously, honest question, what do you- Yeah, yeah, exactly. Also, we find out the cube is compressing into itself. All the rooms are becoming one. All the realities are starting to collapse into one space. So Simon and Kate inevitably meet each other, but Kate manages to stab Simon in the eye. <laughs> Only for him to be behind her. More aged, with a hole in his eye. You know what, for the sake of the film, I'll accept the fact that he survived the eye stab, Medic! despite the fact having no medical treatment inside the cube. By the look of him, he's aged drastically. So how did he survive with no water? So he kills Sasha. <laughs> Kate manages to knock him out and finds out all the watches led to a countdown of when the cube implodes. She escapes the cube in the, <laughs> the worst CGI I have ever seen in my life, unironically. <sighs> Remember how Cube 1 had mostly practical effects with very brief CGI? And even when the CGI was used, it was hidden by how dark the cube was? This is why the lighting in Cube 2 doesn't work. Like, showing everything is not a good idea. Also, when Kate escapes, we find out she was working for eyes on the whole time. Her handler looks like Gus Fring. She gives like a USB stick that Sasha had and... Yeah, then she gets shot. Nice shot! Overall, Cube 2 is a massive disappointment and misses the mark immensely. It's not even funny bad, it's just a very bland movie that doesn't understand what made the original great. Kinda like all those, uh, Disney live action remakes. But you know what? I don't want to be Mr. Cynical. Before I go, I will state some things that Cube 2 does right. Now, we learn at the end of the film that Kate was working for the company the whole time. She actually subtly shows this by downplaying when people make discoveries and trying to get info out of people when it seems like she's just trying to make conversation. Now, this is getting ridiculous. You know, her role wasn't to actually kill anyone. It was just to get a MacGuffin and then leave. You've also got this cool scene where you can see Kate see herself, only for her to be in that same position later. You know, it's the only subtle thing in this entire film. Also, this one bit where Kate and Sasha stumble into a room where the entire cast died of dehydration. Now, this would be an interesting take if the film was done better. In Cube 1, people only died from traps or from other people's actions. We never actually looked at the perspective of people giving up entirely. Worth in the first film was close, but only stuck with the group because some small part of him clung to freedom. I will admit, it is an interesting microcosm of what could have been. And finally... <laughs> It's set in a cube. What else do you want me to say, man? Yes, I'm aware that there's another sequel, Cube Zero, and apparently Lionsgate want to remake the original film and call it Cubed. That film is still on hold as of 2019. Look, all I'm saying is, if you don't have a character to say boot it, you're not getting my money. Boot it. Thank you all for watching. I know this is something different, but I really enjoyed making it. Cube is a classic I've seen many times and never actually got around to making a video on it. If you like my movie reviews, Please tell me in the comment section and also share on how much you love your wife. Yes.